Hello and welcome to Tech for Non-Techies, the only podcast that demystifies the fast-growing technology sector. I'm your host, Sophia Madriega, Chicago Beef MBA and tech entrepreneur. My aim here is to give you the skills, knowledge and confidence to find opportunities in the tech sector, whether that's through founding a company, getting a dream job or bringing a fresh perspective to your work. Hello, smart people. How are you today? I'm feeling very proud of myself today because yesterday I gave a talk about tech entrepreneurship to MIT alumni. Seriously, me, a non-technical founder, giving a talk to the graduates of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So in the audience, there were CTOs and engineers and, you know, a professor of AI. So just casual, you know, not the entire audience had backgrounds in software, because clearly that is not the only form of technology in the world. And also that's not the only type of MIT grad that you have. But even the ones who did have backgrounds in software, they were there because they wanted to learn where non-technical leaders stumble when it comes to tech. Because you see, ambitious people without computer science backgrounds who want to have a great business career, they need to understand core technology concepts. I mean, you already know that because that's why you're here listening to this podcast. But ambitious people who have technical backgrounds, so they're developers, for example, and if they want to rise to the top of organizations and they want to become a chief technology officer, they need to understand core business concepts. Because a CTO has to be a strategic counterpart to a CEO. So they have to understand each other, which means that they have to have a common language. So the techies need to learn business. The business people need to learn tech. And there's a really good episode on this topic with Jennifer Byrne, who used to be the chief technology officer of Microsoft in the US. So pretty important. And she talked about how her role was actually more like a diplomat rather than a developer, which... I thought was fascinating and unexpected. And, you know, speaking of CEOs and CTOs, today I'm going to give you a view from the top. I send out a monthly email about Tech for Non-Techies and I share what I'm working on and my insights on technology and on business trends. And it's an invite-only newsletter and the recipients are mostly people who run basically the business world. So there are some C-suite people from Fortune 500 companies, some leading VCs and, you know, of course, a bunch of academics. This audience doesn't necessarily need lessons on technology concepts, but they're looking for a broader overview of how technology fits into business strategy and into the economy. And one of the topics that they ask me about most is how data science and machine learning actually work in practice in companies, as in how can they use these technologies in their businesses and how are other businesses that are sort of similar to theirs in some way or how are other businesses using AI. And on this show, on this podcast, we often talk about how to do things on a shoestring budget. Because many of my audience are entrepreneurs or early stage investors. And, you know, it's obvious what kind of problems you have if you have a tiny budget. So if you have very little cash, you have to forego investments and you have to learn how to do things yourself and, you know, put some things off. But having a massive budget to invest into tech also has its challenges, but they're just different challenges. When you're not resource constrained, you can just waste money on doing stupid things for a very long time. And there's actually a very colorful case study on this, which I did, and it's called How to Burn $2 Billion. So go back and listen to that. It is about a real company. And I mean, anyway, I, I won't talk about that because I already shared that on another podcast, on another episode rather. And another point about being in a large company with lots of money is that if you launch a technology that doesn't really work properly, or for example, if it really annoys your customers, you could also do it at a massive scale. So your mistakes can be very, very visible. So I just want you to know that don't think that money is the solution to all company and tech problems. Because lots of cash with little knowledge does not lead to anything good. But obviously, 
That's not going to apply to you because you are a smart listener of Tech for Non-Techies. And for this episode, you're not just a smart listener of Tech for Non-Techies, you are the chief executive of a large company. So let's imagine that you're the chief exec of a large company. And so this means that you are the leader of the company strategy and you're in charge of the business model. So very exciting. I hope you're feeling very powerful because you have the power to invest in tech and you have the power and the money to hire lots of engineers. In this position, the questions you should ask are not what can I afford, but what do I need to reach my aims? What do I need to reach my strategic aims? And remember here, technology is a tool, not an end in itself. And in general, technology is used to basically do three things. One, reach scale. Two, increase efficiency. And three, increase customer satisfaction. So most tech initiatives fit into one of these three buckets. If you're the chief exec of a large company and you're talking to your chief technology officer, you're basically interested in reaching scale, increasing efficiency, and making your customers happier. And as a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, you are used to keeping an eye on what your competitors are doing and, you know, basically plagiarizing their ideas. This is normal. Everybody does that. But the point with AI is... If you only scan your competition, you could miss out how to use AI in your organization. That's because data science and machine learning are essentially decision-making tools that can basically help you to make better, faster decisions. Any company, regardless of sector, can collect data, process it, and use it to predict outcomes. Whether that company is a media company, like, I don't know, Meta, or a healthcare company, or even a big bank. And that's why it's useful to learn from all of the sectors and see where the AI leaders are in these sectors and see how do these leaders make decisions using AI. Because every business has to make decisions. I mean, that's what we're all doing here. Collecting data, analyzing it, and then using it to predict outcomes is basically what AI is. And in broad strokes, that's what people mean when they're talking about data science and machine learning. So let's go back. Uh, you are the CEO. You're the leader of the company's strategy. So how is AI useful to you? We talked about reaching scale, efficiencies, and customer satisfaction. So the biggest use case for AI is making decisions faster and at a larger scale. You'll hear some people say that AI makes more accurate decisions. That is true in some cases, but it isn't true in a lot of cases. And that's important for you to know. But if we were to delve into that topic, this episode would be too long. So we'll just cover that on another episode. But essentially, what I want you to know is that the trend that I'm seeing for how companies use AI is as a helper to support making decisions rather than being the decision maker. And I'll show you an example so you can have kind of a visual in your head of what this means. So some of you might have heard about a company called Stitch Fix. Stitch Fix is a fashion retail company. So if you sign up to Stitch Fix, you will get a box of clothes picked out for you by stylist, which will arrive at your door every month. And then you can try on the clothes in your box and decide what to keep. And you obviously then pay for what you keep and send back the stuff that you don't want to keep. So when you first join Stitch Fix as a customer, they will send you an onboarding form and they'll ask you, you know, about your body measurement, about your hair color, skin and eye color and your style preferences. Obviously, Stitch Fix wants you, the customer, to keep as many of the items that it sends you as possible because that's how it makes money. So the stylist has to choose things that you really want, things that you really don't want to send back. And so that means lots of things. It means that the clothes have to fit you really well, so they have to go well onto your body. But they also have to be in a style that you like. And they also have to be relevant to your actual life. Because, I mean, honestly, I want to dress like Jennifer Lopez on the red carpet every single day. But when you're giving a talk to a bunch of MIT alumni about technology, you cannot turn up in chiffon and feathers, unfortunately. Maybe I should give it a go for my next talk. 
Hmm. Anyway, my point is that to get this close selection right, it involves a lot of work and a lot of decision making. And that's why this level of customer care is usually reserved for very, very high end expensive retailers and boutiques. But Stitch Fix is mid market. So it isn't that expensive. So basically, how are they doing it? Obviously, using AI. And I know that there are some engineers listening to this podcast now. And hang on, before you get overexcited, put down the code and listen to me. So far, when tech companies have tried to create AI stylists and set those stylists on customers, it has not worked. Lots of companies have tried this, including Amazon Fashion. And Amazon Fashion tried it and the customers did not like it, so they got rid of it. And obviously, Amazon Fashion has some pretty good developers and data scientists. So this is why at Stitch Fix, they have a different way of using AI. They have a stylist algorithm that takes the information that you provided in your onboarding form. So, you know, about your body size and your skin color, eye color, all of that. And then it combines that information with feedback about things that you've previously rejected. So all the clothes that you've sent back in the boxes. And using this information, this stylist algorithm scans their stock selection and basically makes suggestions about what to send you. But, and this is critical, the suggestions that the AI stylists make do not go straight to you. They don't go straight to the customer. Instead, they go to the human stylist. So there is a level of a human stylist. So there's the AI stylist, the human stylist, and then you. So the AI stylist suggestions go to the human stylist. And then the human stylist then picks out a smaller selection and decides what goes in your box. So let's put some imaginary numbers on this. Let's imagine that Stitch Fix has 1,000 items that it sells. And those 1,000 items, you know, they're skirts and dresses and T-shirts and blouses and whatever. So those 1,000 items can be combined into 3,000 different outfits. And 3,000 different outfits is far too much for a human stylist to sift through. So that's where AI comes in. So the AI can narrow down those 3,000 outfit options down to, say, 10 outfit options that this AI thinks are going to be relevant to you. And then those 10 outfit options go to the human stylist, and then the human stylist selects three looks. And then they still alter those looks using their creative flair. So maybe they add some accessories that the AI didn't come up with, or they switch up the outfits in a different and interesting way. And I just want you to know, I made those numbers up for our demonstration. I didn't actually know the precise number of outfit options that Stitch Fix has, but I imagine it's quite a lot because they are a big publicly listed retailer. What I just described is AI-powered human decision-making. So in this case, AI gives you an almost complete solution, but it's not 100%. So there are still too many options because essentially those options, you know, the stylist knows that they're not actually good enough to send to the customer. So for companies who want to get started with AI... This is actually a less scarier way of doing things than a fully automated process because you do have that human check. And while some processes can be totally automated, a lot still can't be because they involve an element of creativity, like the, you know, the stylist adding some kind of interesting accessory, which is very fashion forward. Or maybe because data still can't be processed properly. So, for example, a lot of voice data, especially women's voices, it's not processed as well as men's voices. So this is why AI takes you to a certain point, but often it can't give you a complete, basically perfect job. And that's why you often have AI helping decision makers rather than actually being a decision maker. And if you listen to the episode that I did with David Wells, the former CFO of Netflix, he talked about how Netflix combines data insights with their own human creative expertise. 
So listen to that episode, but, you know, just as a summary, he said that Netflix buys shows and ideas for shows from production companies and, and from writers. And Netflix algorithms analyze data on this new content, and they basically suggest how much the company should bid on new shows. So basically, how much should the production house get paid for a movie? But while this suggestion is made by an algorithm, the actual ultimate decision maker on whether to buy a new show from an indie production house and how much to pay for it actually rests with the human content team because they have creative instinct and that creative instinct has clearly worked out very well for Netflix. So creative instinct in this case and in the Stitch Fix case, Stitch Fix case rather, it has not been replaced by data. It has been enhanced. And that's the general trend that I'm seeing when it comes to embedding AI into organizations. And this, my dears, is what digital collaboration is all about. And this is what I keep on talking about in this podcast. It's a perfect example of non-techies using tech to do their jobs better. And that's where the business and the economy are going. And if you want to be a successful leader and innovate in today's world... You have to learn how to be a digital collaborator. I literally don't see any other way. And that's what I teach you at Tech Fun on Techies. There are two ways to work with me and Tech Fun on Techies. One is for corporates and one is for individuals. For individuals, we have the Tech Fun on Techies membership. Non-technical people have used it to succeed in tech businesses, break into careers in tech, invest in startups and build companies as non-technical founders. If you fancy any of these outcomes for your life, then apply for a consultation call so we can talk through your goals and through your options. The link for the application is in the show notes. And if you work in a corporate and that corporate wants to increase its productivity and innovation, because why the hell not, then get in touch in the details in the show notes. Because that's what narrowing the gap between your tech teams and your non-tech teams does. Because the best ideas and outcomes come from collaboration. So, you know, you have people who are terrified of speaking to the developers. You're not actually going to come up with the best products. Thank you, my dears, for investing yourself today and for getting smarter because you're getting smarter with every single episode that you're listening here. So thank you for listening to this episode, my dear smart person. On that note, I'm wishing you a wonderful day and I'll be back in your lovely ears with some more learning next week. Ciao.